this uh, evening's tithes and offerings if you would uh, join with me. Amen. Uh, Tesla, I read an article about how it leads the U.S. in car crashes. There was a survey that was done recently, and they analyzed the four categories of these. So there's uh, accidents, there's driving under the influence, speeding, and citations. And these citations that were clocked were um, reckless driving, improper lane usage, lack of insurance, lack of indicator, brake lights, and they said that Tesla leads the country in these four categories. And you think Tesla has the smartest car on the market. I mean, they really, they really had to dial in on, on everything that performed when it comes to the economy of it, the, the way the computer is. It's so high tech. And you think, I don't know what you think when you see a Tesla. I automatically think, okay, that's a rich person, and they got a good job, and they know how to live. But according to our study here, it doesn't show that. And then you can have the smartest car, but it, that doesn't change the person that's behind the wheel. And I know many smart people that make very, very silly choices. I don't know if you know anybody like that. I know some smart people that are not good financially. And they make a lot of bad decisions. And uh, and I believe, like I said, I like I don't know how you think about Tesla drivers. God bless them, but it shows us what what uh, the statistics don't lie, numbers don't lie. Well, the Bible says in Psalms 36, verse 7, How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of delights. So no matter what bracket we find ourselves in financially, it doesn't really matter if you're the smartest. It doesn't matter what IQ you fit into. I'm going to tell you, as long as you learn how to honor God, you take refuge in Him. He provides everything. He provides the financing. He provides the security. And not only that, because we think when we give, it's like, okay, I'm going to get a big check coming in. God blesses in many other ways. He blesses you with peace. He blesses you with friends. He blesses you, like I said, with security. Because that's who God is. He cares about your whole character, not just your bank account. But understand, uh, we can give to God no matter where we are in life. Learn to give. And I'm going to tell you, he says, uh, the shadow of your wings is worth it. So let's go ahead and pray and ask God to help us. Uh, and if you would like to give, uh, you give many different ways, cash, check, and then we do have that description on the YouTube, how to give as well, that will lead you to give it to the church. And then tithes and offerings, God helps us. Go ahead and pray. God, we thank you for the blood. We thank you, God, for your opportunity to give, God. I pray you will bless your people. Give us, Lord, the security, God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Glory to God. If you have your Bibles, you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. Hallelujah. We're going to read out of two portions of Scripture today. So it's going to be Matthew chapter 27. We're going to start in verse 62. And then we are going to jump into Matthew 28. It's just one more page over, depending if you have a page Bible or if you have your phone. So it's going to be Matthew 28, verse 11. So again, I'll say that Matthew 27, 62 and Matthew 28, verse 11. That's where I will be reading from this evening. Glory to God. God is good and he's worthy. And he helps us. Amen. So it has been said that Taylor Swift is part of a government covert operation to reelect Biden in 2024. And the poll shows that one third of Americans believe that she is indeed part of this covert operation. And it, and it brings to the idea that when she was dating, she's dating uh, um, uh, Travis Kelsey, and they said that the whole game was rigged, and, and that's why they won the Super Bowl, so she could perform the halftime show, and so she could have such popularity to endorse 
the next president. But the reality is that many people believe in some sort of conspiracy theory. Going back to John F. Kennedy's assassination uh, with the magic bullet, going to 9-11 with uh, the idea that the government was behind it, going to aliens for the past 50 years. Americans have believed that uh, the government has been hiding these green aliens inside tubes for Area 51. But I'm going to talk about one conspiracy theory that has been going on for over 2,000 years. It has been circulating ever since. Jesus rising or being raised from the grave. That was a conspiracy theory that the Pharisees and the Jews have promoted back in the time. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of people still believe in the conspiracy theory that the Pharisees have raised that Jesus did not rise from the grave. I'm going to tell you, Jesus is alive and well, and he has risen from the grave. Amen. So let's go ahead and read, if you will. We're going to read, like I said, out of those two portions of Scripture. Matthew 27, it's just four verses, then we're going to Matthew 28. Verse 62. The next day, one of uh, the next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, the disciples may come and steal the body and tell people that he had been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take guard, Pilate answered, so make the tomb as secure as you know. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the doll. Now we're going to Matthew 28, verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and purported, reported to the chief priests everything that had been, that happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders, devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. Telling them, you are to say, disciples stole, came at night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets out to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Amen. The covert conspiracy theory. Hallelujah. Let's pray in this place. God, I thank you for the blood. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit. And God, I thank you that you did, in fact, rise from the grave. And I thank you for all that you are doing in our lives, God. I pray that you would make a revelation known of your spirit this day. We give you praise. We give you honor. And help me as I preach your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So, conspiracy theories. If we would talk real quickly about the theory that went back to Jesus' day. Because Jesus spoke about what he was going to do with his disciples. He did not keep it a secret. He didn't, he didn't say whispering under his mouth what was going to happen to him. He told them, I'm going to go to the cross. And three days later, I will rise again. Luke 24, verse 7. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hand of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. This is not a secret. This was out there and Jesus said this is exactly what is going to happen to me and in fact it actually did he did go to the cross he did get crucified and he did rise again for the sole reason of setting the captive free and taking the keys of Hades Revelation 1 18 I am the living one I was dead and now look I am alive forever and ever and hold the keys of death and Hades, hallelujah and amen. That's what I look forward to because that is our God. For some reason, what he said here made Pharisees upset. And they wanted to kill him because of the following he was creating. And all the, the, feathered, uh, uh, the ruffling of the feathers that he did. He said, sir, remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver... Man, imagine him saying, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order, have the tomb made secure. 
until the third day. Otherwise, the disciples will come and steal his body. And the deception will be worse than the first. So right in this text, you hear about the fear of these men. Put a guard on the tomb. Don't let anybody, don't let someone come and steal his body because that's a dangerous thing. If the disciples come and choose to steal him, then they might believe that he did actually rise from the grave. So what is wrong with this statement? What is so wrong by, by Jesus rising from the grave? What, what is such the big deal? Couldn't they just let Jesus live, preach his word, and be the Messiah that they've always wanted? What is the big deal? Well, the reason why it was such a big deal is because the same reason for us. If the reality is if there really was a Jesus, if there really was a crucifixion, if there really was a tomb, a grave, a then that means every word that he said was true. And that really means that God is real. Because that's the underlying tone of our story. Is many people hated Jesus. They, they despised him. He wasn't this popular hippie that walked around that everybody just loved. He was despised by everybody around him that he would confront because he, the Bible says, was the light and he would shine on darkness. And they said darkness doesn't like the light. So he would make things known that people didn't like. He brought a knife to the culture of the religious world. But he said these statements, you will come to me. All who come on to me will find rest. All you who are weary and heavy laden, come, take my yoke. What is wrong with that statement? What is the big deal that... I don't know about you, that gives me hope. I love hearing those words. Those words bring satisfaction to my soul. That I know there's a Savior that loves me. And that He died for me. And that He is there for me. What is wrong with that? Well, again, if He really did go to the cross, then that means there really is a God. And if there really is a God, then there really is judgment. So this is where conspiracy theories are used to keep people off balance. They're used and given just enough truth for people to believe. Because all that being said, we're talking about what really did happen. There really is a God. And there really was a Jesus. We can look at history books and we can do our studies and find out there really was a Jesus. He placed everything, if you didn't know, God placed everything on Jesus going to the cross. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 9, We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which He has given us about His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Who does not believe that God has came down would it be a liar because... They have been believed, the, the, not the testimony. So God gave His Son that He would have eternal life, and this life is in the Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Because John is writing here that He put everything on Jesus Christ. His whole testimony, God's testimony. You ever think about what God's testimony is? Yeah, we can read the the first book of Genesis, and you can see how God made everything. He made the planets. He made the stars. He made all the giraffes. He made every animal. He made every plant. He did it all. And you think that's enough to say, okay, that's God's testimony. That's a pretty big resume. But God's testimony is greater, the Bible says. It is about His Son. Everything is about His Son coming down and dying on the cross. So when we understand the conspiracy theory that surrounds our scripture, it says here, take guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know. So they went and made the tomb secure, putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. They were intending on keeping the truth locked. But you can't keep the truth locked. Do you know the truth always comes out? No matter what it is, the truth will always come to the surface because it has weight to it. It has value to it. Lies always disintegrate. No one can keep a lie forever. 
You can try, but it's not going to work. You can try and save face all you want, but it will never go the long distance. But truth always has a standard. And that's exactly what is going on. They tried locking it. They tried putting guards, armed guards, armed. You ever seen the Brink guy that walk, that drive around these big armored vehicles that go to these banks and they have all this money and these guys have all these, uh, you know, they got the nine mil, they got the shape, the, the armored vest, they got the armored vehicle, they got the M16 because they think, man, if somebody comes to try breaking in my, my truck with all this money, I'm going to stop them. Well, that's what happened back then. They had all the, the, the guard ship there. They're covering it. And then even Pilate put his own seal. That if it would be broken, they would know that somebody tampered with what was inside. And people believed the lie. So this is exactly what these theories are meant to do. Conspiracy theories, they're meant to keep the individual guessing. And they make them wavering on the truth and the lie because it's like, man, this thing could be true, but it also could be fake. You know, you talk to people who are what's called agnostic. Agnostic means that you believe that there is a God, but you don't want to fully admit that. And you don't want to say that there isn't a God because you're already going with one side because it's like they're playing on the fence of what they want to do. So there's a little bit of truth for them, but they also have a lie that they're holding on to. And that's just like these conspiracy theories. You know, you, you read about these things, you watch YouTube, and I don't suggest going down this rabbit hole because once you go down, I mean, you're in trouble. You know, when you start looking at alien videos and and these weird assassination, I'm telling you, there's this stupid, stupid history uh, channel, man, and they put this dumbest thing. It's called Ancient Aliens, and it's retarded. It's about these these silly guys that just say, oh, these aliens are coming, and you know the government has all these aliens in Area 51 in a tube, and you say, dang, you know. And, and to, the, to the unbeliever, man, you, you kind of go with it a little bit. And then, and then there's videos about this elite group of people that if they shake their hand a certain way, you know that they have some kind of allegiance. And, and, uh, and there's other things. You play the music backwards, and it's supposed to tell you a secret message. Right? I just named a few, man. I could go for many more conspiracy theories. See, I only had to put a, a little bit out there. And you think, man, what if it's true? You know, wouldn't that be interesting if these these things were laced with truth? Because the reality is 9-11 really did happen. That was a true event. But it can be also used as a way that it was fake, that it was fabricated. The magic bullet for John F. Kennedy, how it came out of nowhere, struck this man, and how he moved in the video. And they said, oh yeah, that was a magic bullet that hit him. Go watch the thing. Actually, I don't suggest watching it because you get lost in the rabbit hole. The universe really is a massive place. So they make people believe that, man, there really could be aliens out there because how many planets, how many solar systems, how many suns, how many moons. You say, oh, they found another planet that looks just like Earth. Same atmosphere, same everything. has water. Oh, there could be people. Because they lace truth in there. There really is rich people. There really is a rich society that rules. Right? This is a little bit of truth. And I'm not advocating for these for us to look into it. I find it a waste of time. But the idea here is it keeps people off balance when conspiracy theories are thrown out there. I used to have friends that, man, all they did was watch YouTube. I mean, that's a dangerous place to go down there. Because you start watching cat videos, and before you know it, man, you're down the rabbit hole and looking at weird things that shouldn't be looked at. Right? I mean, there's, there's this guys right now. Um, I know this is not in my note, but there's, uh, what's his name, Cat Williams. Yeah, he's talking about all this stuff, the secret society of these comedians and rappers. And again... There's truth in there, but I don't know. I try not to go down that route. 
But the devil honestly would want nothing more for you to believe that Jesus did not rise from the grave. He wants people to be so blind to this fact. And that's what we read in our scripture. Telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets out to the governor, I will satisfy. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Understand that the book of Matthew was written right after Jesus was, uh, was crucified. So you're talking within 20, 30 years of Jesus rising from the grave. And you have the whole Pentecost movement. And you have Matthew writing as he's living this life with Jesus. And he's writing this and saying, this is what they believe to this day. He's telling people they are still lost. Because imagine him. They all knew who Jesus was. And as he's telling people, hey, Jesus died for us. They said, oh, no, that's not true. What, didn't one of your guys steal him? So let's look at a few lies that the enemy wants us to believe first. Is that Jesus was some crazy long-haired lunatic. That wasn't the Son of God. Because if He was, that would make Him God. John 10, 24, the Jews who were gathered around Him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe the works I do. For my Father's names testify about me. Jesus claimed to be God. On multiple occasions. Many times to know. Do your own homework on this. Look how many times Jesus claimed to be God. So with that being understood. We know that he said I am God. I am the great I He said I am. So without this claim idea that is going on. He would make himself out. The devil would say no this guy was a nutcase. He was a religious nutcase that just kept saying blabbering words that didn't really mean anything. And that is just the simplicity of the lies that he said, go tell them the disciples stole the body. What a simple lie that is. It, it's so easy to say, yeah, man went in there, rolled the stone away, took the body and buried it somewhere in the desert. So they would believe it, right? What a lie that is. So simple. But that lie has been circulating over and over and over again. And people even in Jesus' time when he was alive, they did not believe in who he was. They said, oh, are you just the son of a carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, and Judas? Aren't his sisters with them? And they took offense at that. They said, oh, this guy's just a normal dude. He doesn't really mean anything. He's just speaking these words. He did miracles, but what's the big deal? He is not the Son of God. And the second thing is about that you are not forgiven. This is such a lie that the enemy has. That God did not, the Bible says, John 3, 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to, uh, from the world to condemn it, but to save the world through Him. How many people understand that God forgives? He doesn't hold grudges. He doesn't have anything against people. He literally sent his son to die for sin. But the lie out there says that you are not forgiven, that you can't be forgiven. There's people who've done the worst things on this planet. And God doesn't have a, a divider. If you just say, you're beyond salvation. You're beyond forgiveness. No, he, he, he died for all mankind. So Jesus really did rise on the third day. Then that means that we are forgiven. That we can be forgiven. And if he didn't, then it meant nothing. Because he rose to defeat sin and to bring forgiveness. But hell reminds people that you're still broke, busted, and disgusted. No hope. Lost in this world. No future. The third lie is that God doesn't love you. I just said that John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Do you understand that God loves you? Oh, that God loves you. It's such a good thing to know that God loves you. You know, he doesn't hate you. He doesn't, he doesn't look at you, man, I can't wait to send you to hell. That's not who God is. He doesn't make your life worse. He doesn't sit there with the chest piece and say, you know what? I'm going to screw their life up today. No. God literally loved the world so much that he gave his son. But the lie is that Jesus didn't die for sin. The lie is that he was a lunatic who just walked on water. A lunatic that just was screaming at people in the middle of the street. You know, and people say this book has been written a thousand times and it's been written hundreds if not thousands of years after the fact and it's written by so many people and edited over and over and over and over. This is this is the lie. It's a lie. I, I remember witnessing to a guy and he says, the first thing he said to me, I said, hey man, do you know Jesus loves you? That's all I said to him. And he said, hey, that book, the Bible, he said that book has been written over and over again. Right? So he's been deceived. And I told him, I looked in his face and said, man, you believe a lie. Do your research. So the lie, what it is, is just a broken promise. It keeps people stuck. It keeps people feeling hopeless. Imagine if my only hope was to say, oh man, the disciples came and stole his body away. My only hope was just this, uh, the tomb was empty by man's hands. That would leave me hopeless. That would leave me saying, man, what's the point of this? But I do know there's a point. Because there really is a God. And he really is the savior of the world. But there's a deceiver that the Bible says that Jesus quoted this man. Jesus knows his character. He said he was a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to the truth, for there was no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He says, the devil, Satan himself, all he speaks is lies. That's his only language. He doesn't speak truth ever because there is no truth in him. That's what he's saying. He said, look at the, the liar himself. He's trying to tell you about him. He's trying to bring us an understanding that this guy does not tell the truth. And that's exactly what hell wants us to believe. So we need to learn how to accept the truth. Because look what happened when the lie hit the disciples. Many of them believed, but even some of them doubted. Matthew 28, verse 16, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. What an amazing thing to understand is that they went to the exact place that Jesus said, I'm going to be at. He was there. Some worshipped and some doubted. That sounds just like us. We have to know that even doubts can penetrate the most stern believers. You have to see from this worldview that they walked with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They slept on the same ground with him. They watched them open eyes. They watched them walk on water. They watched them calm storms. And to tell them everything that was going to happen actually happened. Jesus, everything that he said to the T actually happened. But the fact is, some still doubt it. The Bible has a man named Thomas. And Thomas was a doubter. They call him Thomas the doubter because he always doubted. And he said to, to his, his friends after he found out that Jesus did rise from the grave, he said, you know what? It, uh, I, he said, disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, unless I put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands on the side, I will not believe. So reality is, is that we all have a little bit of Thomas inside of us, right? We all got a little bit of doubt. 
Because we know the truth, but the reality is, man, there's that little seed that's planted in there. Is what if this is not real? Can I just spend my Sundays else somewhere, right? Can I just do something else on Wednesday nights? Can I do something else on Friday, Bible study? Can I just do something else instead of praying, right? Can I just live my Sunday sleeping in and uh, from my hangover, right? Can I just do something else? That's just a little bit of lie. He says, I'll have to touch his scars to believe. But what he's saying here is you're going to have to prove to me without a doubt that he did actually rise from the grave. Because doubt entered his heart. But the reality is, is there is a cure to doubt. There is a cure to know who Jesus is. Did you know that? There really is a cure. When people tell me, oh, I cried out to God and he didn't show up, I said, what? I did the same thing and he showed up. I'm no special than you. I'm no better than you. So, so my Bible says if I call on him, he will answer. But what happened was is that Jesus actually had a conversation with Thomas. Did you know that? So before... When Thomas made that statement, before I, I got to touch him to know that he died, I got to do all this. Well, Jesus already knew about Thomas's character. And he had a conversation with them, which helps us understand doubt. In John 14, verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we, how can we know the way? Right? What an interesting question to ask Jesus, right? Jesus, I don't know where you're going, but... How, how do we really know that you are telling the truth here? Well, Jesus answered him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus was giving a foreshadowing of Thomas. He is saying, I am the way. Everything you need to know in life, I am it. And I am the truth, meaning I only speak truth and nothing but the truth. Come on, somebody. That's what I like. What Jesus is giving this man is a blueprint how to find God. Because the reality is you got to seek him. And you got to accept him as truth. Because he is the truth. He, that's all he speaks was truth. He doesn't have any lying inside of him. He was always telling people exactly what is in our hearts. And he knew everything. And you have to seek God. With everything and, and understand that he is saying the truth. So if we have this understanding, we seek God with our whole heart. What that means is you will touch his wounds. If you really seek God, you will touch his wounds. And you will know that it's truth. And the reason why I say that is because I've known people that were so messed up in life. I mean lost in the world. I mean lost to sin. Lost to Whatever the world had to offer them. They were so messed up on drugs, alcohol, I mean perverse lifestyles. But the reality is when they came to an altar, they repented. They asked Jesus to come into their lives. But right there at that moment, guess what happened? They touched the scars of Jesus. Because he said, the Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. So when he touched them stripes, you are set free. Set free. Because he the son sets free is free indeed. So when you come to God like that, when you come to God and touch his stars, I'm going to tell you something. You find him. He is not hidden. He's not hiding behind a rock playing hide and seek with mankind. He is not waiting and oh, see what they're going to do with me. No. He is standing, the Bible says, at our hearts and knocking. That's the kind of God that I love. So I know there's conspiracy theories out there. You know what I mean? I know there's so many. Oh my gosh. I would it would spend it would take me literally days to tell every single one out there. But the biggest conspiracy theory that mankind has believed is that there is no God. And that Jesus did not rise from the grave. And I debated on preaching this for Easter. But I thought about it. I said, man, I'm going to just do it now. Because the reality is, do we believe it or not? Is it a theory or is it truth? 
and I believe it's truth, and I know it's truth, because I've seen it too many times. I count too many times of people set free, because we serve a God that really does set the captive free. Amen. If we could do one more thing, we'll bow our heads, close our eyes, respecting our neighbor and all those around us. I want to thank everybody for coming and being here. You're faithful. Amen. And you know what? I, I don't know what God has in store for people's lives. I, I just know it's good. Because he says, I have a plan for you to prosper. I have a plan to do all these things. And no eye can see, no mind can comprehend what the plans of those he has for those who love him. That's who God is. He, he truly has a plan for us. But these lies come in, and like I said, I don't, I don't know what anybody's going through, but the lies come in, and they, they bring such a deception. They say, no, you can never be set free. You can never be forgiven. There is no God. You're stuck the way you are because you were meant to be stuck. You're meant to be down deep in a hole trying to figure out life, lost. Well, that's not true. The truth is that... Jesus really did come on this earth. And every word that he said really did happen. Even the book of John, he says not enough words, not enough books can, in the world can contain what Jesus has done on this planet. You're talking only three years of ministry. There's not enough books that can contain everything he did because every life he touched was another you know, however many years they lived, he did a miracle for them. And that is a book right then in itself. Every Christian, every testimony that is walking on this planet, I'm telling you, they're another book. But the lie is that he did not come into this world, that he just didn't die for us. And I don't know where you stand today. I don't know where you're at. But I'm going to tell you, God does love you. And I'm going to give you this opportunity. If you want to rededicate, you want to solidify what God wants to do in your life, you might find yourself steering or veering off uh, just like the Tesla drivers. Well, good news is that God can redirect our lives. So if there's anybody here who's just not right with God, I want you to do one thing. I want to pray with you. Just raise your hand. I'll lead you to a simple prayer. God wants to help us. God wants to solidify his 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 uh his way in your life. Amen. His will. Hallelujah. It's for the church, for us. Right now, God wants to solidify who he is in your life. And I believe we have to do that from time to time. But we got to be like, God, I need you right now. And I need, to, I need to know in my heart, you are right. You are real. Because even over time, you can believe it. You can get, you get touched by God. When you first get saved, but as time rolls on, we can start believing that man, maybe this is not true. Maybe this is fake. Maybe this was made up. Maybe I am spinning my wheels, wasting my time. So we need to solidify just who God is. I tell you, God reminds us of his goodness. Amen. So I want to do one thing. I want to open up the altars. Maybe God might be speaking to you about these things. Let him talk to you. And I, I pray that God will help us. Hallelujah. God, I thank you for the blood. God, I thank you, oh God, that your blood that speaks a better word to our lives. God, that you came down in this earth uh, to set the captive free, to bring liberty to those that are bound. For you took uh, the keys from hell, from, from Hades itself, uh, to bring life. And God, I'm asking, Lord God, to bring a refreshing to our souls. God, anybody who is battling the doubts, the lies, the deception from the enemy, God, I come against that, God. And I pray that you would make a revelation known in their hearts of who you are. God, make yourself so real, so true, God, that there would be no doubt. God, I come against all fear and all uncertainty right now, God. Oh, she anda ra 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 yando re de de anda yanda ra ba ba yanda re re yando she anda ra ba. Holy, 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 hallelujah! God, I thank you for the blood. God, I thank you for your grace and your mercy, my God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah! She anda ra ba ba yanda re de de anda. 
Yanda Rabba Ba Yanda Ra 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 Yanda Shi Yanda Rabba Worthy, worthy, worthy. Hallelujah. Amen. Who give God praise in this place? Shi Yanda Rabba Ba Yanda Ra Ba Ba Yanda. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. We serve a good God. Let us give our whole hearts to Him and we'll be all right. Amen. So let's go ahead and pray. Come back the next appointed time and God will bless us. God, we thank you for the blood. God, I thank you for all that you are doing. Help us, Lord God, as we honor you, Lord. Uh, praise back safely at the next appointed time. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.